Do you like conversation on a variety of topics? Feel like no one wants to talk about the things that interest you? Tired of only hearing the same political, sports, or catastrophe talk? Yeah, we feel that way too. Join two high-functioning geeks as they discuss just about anything under the sun. We can't tell you what we'll be talking about each week because we don't know where our brains will take us. It will be an interesting conversation, though, so hang on and join us. Here comes the Relentless Geekery. My orange is not as bright. <laughs> okay. Hello? Hi. Hi. Hey. hey. <laughs> two, two different voices for you, Catherine. We're working. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, welcome to Relentless Geekery. Yeah. Uh, you know, Stephen and I do this podcast, and we love getting a chance to talk with our friends who have done um, interesting, unique things. And when we, I already had known that you were interested in the macabre from many conversations that we had at monthly gatherings and stuff. When we found out that you actually had your creepy cat book published, it was like, oh, we got to get her. That was exactly. <laughs> so. Well, I appreciate that. I am, am looking forward to talking to two gentlemen. Okay. Great. All right. Take it away, Al. You got some good questions. Sure. I'll uh, yeah. jump in. So, uh, you know, honestly, uh, kind of the, the broad opening question, like, so what what led you down this path? I, I know, for instance, when we've talked that you really loved Dark Shadows when you were young. Is that one of those things that made a big impression on you and had you really liking, you know, uh, monsters, the dark side, etc.? Were there other movies, other books? What were the influences that had you become Creepy Cat? <laughs> um, well, yes, that's a form, major formative influence in my life, I believe. Um, Dark Shadows for five years was an after-school supplement to my education. There you go. And, Vampire um, soap operas for <laughs> school time fun. Mm -hmm. Dark Shadows um, ran for five years, 1,225 episodes. I watch it every day that I'm home still. I, I have the DVD collection in the coffin box. Um, autographed cool. by all the stars at a convention. It's really cool. You can get that at MPI, or you can get it half price on eBay sometimes. Um, but I, I prefer the VHS tapes, which I still watch. All <laughs> 200, let's say I have 254 of them. <laughs> now, wow. Because I can leave them in my VCR where I left off and just turn it on again, and it's not so hard to find my place. It's funny. Um, Steve and I were just and, talking um, about, yeah. The, the ability to like come back to what you were working on instead of having to go through the entire reload, restart, scroll forward. Right. Type. So okay. Actually, yes. You know, I so VHS tapes are so much more convenient for things like that. Um, and well, Dark Shadows plot lines were based on the classics. It was like a little theater company, a repertory company. The same characters enacted all kinds of classic literature, but they didn't become different, become the characters. They lived those stories, those plots in their own lives, you know, um, albeit with time travel and things. So sometimes they were a previous <laughs> generation, but they, they, the stories are based on the turn of the screw, the Count of Monte Cristo, exactly. uh, Dracula, and... Um, Oh, uh, Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights. Exactly. I remember uh, reading it, that when I... Lovecraft stories. Yep. Ancient so, Greek myths. Exactly. I mean, that. Well, I remember realizing that when I was young. I also watched it, and I was always amazed that it could be as spooky as it was in broad daylight. You know, I'm watching it like at 3.30 in the afternoon or whenever it was on, and it was like, wow, I'm really, like, looking around. You know, is there anybody over my shoulder type stuff? <laughs> It's very character driven. It's um, not it, the special effects were the state of the art at the time, but they don't overwhelm the story of the people. There was the vampire was the first reluctant vampire, Barnabas, yeah. and he was probably Anne Rice's inspiration for in, interview with the vampire. She grew up with them too, um, he, because in parallel time toward the end of the series, um, William H. Loomis is a writer who has writer's block and he needs a story and he finds out he's got a vampire and he locks him in his coffin and chains him in and will let him out only as long as he tells him his life story. 
so he can write a bestseller. Yes, exactly. You know, I, I hadn't thought about that, that relationship to Lestat, that really, I can see that. You know what I mean? And, and that's that's often true, that people are influenced by what they read, saw growing up, and that sometimes when they do it, it isn't like a steal. It's an homage of this way of presenting it, the reluctant vampire instead of the bloodthirsty fiend. You know, like, what what do you get when you live forever? In some cases, it's, wow, I, I really wish I could die. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't want to harm anybody. You kind of have to come, continually come to grips with, you're not who you intended to be <laughs> when you when you were younger. Um, right. Interesting. Okay. And it's also interesting, too, that you'll hear a lot of later horror writers or movie guys say that Dark Shadows was one of their influences. So the second year, the second generation crop of stuff that influences people was all influenced by the same things. It, you get kind of that cycle at times. Exactly. Like the X Files was so much based on the Night Stalker and stuff like right. that. Full Shack, you know, that kind right. of thing. Okay. Right. So, um also grew up on the late night movies with my parents and all the Hammer films. I love the Bella Lugosi Dracula. I used to have Quentin and Barnabas from Dark Shadows hanging over my bed on posters and, and Godzilla. You know? um, but we, we watched all these as a family. That's interesting. I mean, I, my best friend growing up, Stu, we used to have Friday and Saturday night sleepovers, and on Friday night was Screaming Yellow Theater in Chicago with Sven Gulli instead of Goulardi, who they have here in Cleveland. Right. And on Saturday night was Creature Features, and that was that was where you saw, as you just said, all the old um, Hammer movies, the, the real classics, you know, Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, Dracula, and a, a whole bunch of old Roger Corman movies. Corman, yeah. Exactly that. So, but... Having said that, that really was like us kids watching it. The parents were like, okay, you know, don't be too loud. You know, don't go. I don't want to hear a scream from the TV at midnight. <laughs> I'm crying to sleep. <laughs> so, no, my parents were up with me. My mother's favorite movie was Night of the Living Dead. That's pretty and, and Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz. Those are her top favorites. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is an interesting contrast. <laughs> yeah. People are, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, when like you you like these things when you were young and to the point of having posters up having uh so you said you had them like did you start to collect figures plush toys i don't really know did they do the merchandising back then like they do now where uh, if you do dark shadows maybe you had a lunch box but i don't remember there being a whole line of dark shadows merchandise was there yes, I don't know yes about there were um, novels um written they're kind of they're this man wrote like 700 novels. Um, Marilyn Ross is the pen name, but his real name was Dan Ross. And he wrote a series of Dark Shadows novels that came out like monthly for a while, um, but didn't follow the storyline, just some of the characters. Um, there were models of the vampire and the werewolf. There were board games and Josette's music box, by which Barnabas tried to make her over um make um victoria and maggie over into oh, josette cool. yeah. were available i have an extensive collection of dark shadows memorabilia and books um, which i have displayed in my hometown library previously it will be on display at the Menor library in january um how the cool other dark shadows that. fans want to sh share my joy <laughs> nice honestly I'll, I'll put that on my tickler list you know what i mean that's one of those that uh, i'd love to see that i know that we already had a chance when we when we um, went to your party to see some of the things you had set up but i imagine the collection kind of curated in a library it'll it'll be really cool to see all of that and especially the people there will be oh i remember this and be <laughs> mm -hmm. there for it so okay well, millions of us grew up on it and a lot of um people would close their businesses when the show came on because there weren't um vcrs or any way to record things and so they would take their lunch or dinner hours lock their doors and watch dark shadows it was the the afternoon. exactly nice. that's pretty cool <laughs> so um, and I go to the um, conventions as often as I can, and I've stayed at a house in Newport, Rhode Island called Seaview Terrace three times for nice. Halloween parties. Um, it's cool. a privately owned mansion. The Terry family is generous enough to let Dark Shadows fans stay there for um, private house parties. Wow. Um, at, for a couple of weeks, um, it's open for us um, a, a couple times a year. And for the last one, I had a 
local little theater designer um, make me Josette's wedding gown to wear. And I wore her gown and carried her music box, searching for Barnabas. Oh, my. Honestly, one of the joys of being around today is there really are active fandoms for so many different things. And, you know, people are, they're generous with their stuff. You know, no matter what, I don't know, a particular movie series or, or TV or something like that, there's someone that is the... I don't know, really into it fan, and they don't keep it to themselves. They open their house up for the party. They are the organizer of the, so I, I kind of totally um, you know, off to the edge. I've been to a couple of Weird Al Yankovic conventions that really were, there wasn't any um, wizard world aspect to it. There was no corporation behind it. It was goofy fans that said, we should get all the fans together and enjoy Weird Al stuff. And I imagine that's the case for, Dark Shadows, for um, Babylon 5, for all like the more culty TV shows, it doesn't go away. It People, I don't know, how, so how many, you've been to, I think I read in your book, maybe three out of the six Dark Shadows conventions. Is it an ongoing thing? Does it take place every year, every five years? Like, how, how often have you gone and, and how often does it take place? Well, the, um, they haven't had me for the last couple of years. I'm sure hoping they do in 2022. Um, <laughs> It's been we'll, usually we'll, annually yeah. since like '89, I believe. Wow. And a lot of fans have gone to every one. They alternated between the coasts traditionally. Okay. I've been to three in or two in Terrytown, New York, um, where the mansion is that they used for the movies, 1970, Night of Dark Shadows, in 1971. That's right. I saw that in House of Dark Shadows in '71, Night of Dark Shadows. Okay. And um, it's the it's an old Jay Gould mansion, which now belongs to the state of New York, and it's it's really cool. You can walk in and see where Mrs. Johnson dropped the tray and cracked the floor um, when she saw Carolyn dead. Nice. Um, exactly. Of blood. I love doing that. You know, when I've been on little tours, like I went in Toronto and I had read a series of books. Uh, let's see, the, the many called not the many colored land, the Fiona Bar tapestry. And so I'm wandering around like the University of Toronto campus, and whatever else it might be. And just what you said, it's like, this is the tree that they talk about that. You know what I mean? Like, it's cool to um, instantiate, get the reality of this is the image the guy had in mind when they were writing the book, <laughs> and I'm right there. That's always a, a little fun extra, if you will, if you can actually find the the Louis L'Amour, here's where they had the shootout, or whatever else it might be. So, okay. That's the whole premise of my book, Creepy Cats Macabre Travels, Falling Around Haunted Towers, Tumbling Castles, and Ghoulish yeah. Graveyards. By the way, uh, you're, getting, you're getting a little soft. It's of essays about traveling to places where stories took place, both okay. in history and fiction. Right. So let's let's jump into that, you know, because I, I haven't read through it. You have, you've been many, many cool places. Sometimes um, real history, sometimes literary history, if you will. So but here's a quick link. You talked about, you know, you were in um, Rhode Island, right? Uh, Providence, I think. And there's not only Dark Shadows things there. There's a whole bunch of H.P. Lovecraft related things there. Um, what did you think? What what did you did, Had you read enough Lovecraft that you were also interested in the whole Arkham University and what the, the real world parallels were that he was writing about, about that um, the Cthulhu world, if you will, the whole mythos and things from under the ocean and that maybe we have human fish crossbreeds and stuff like that. What what brought you there? It actually, Dark Shadows. I um, hadn't read H.P. Lovecraft until I heard, um, you know, reading through the sources of Dark Shadows. When I am interested in anything, I try to go back to the primary sources. Yeah. Uh, I, um, a historian in a, in a literary scholar, as well as a person who likes creepy things. Yes. And so I'm always, you know, I look in a bibliography for the next book to read. I want to find the sources. So dark, when I learned of all Dark Shadow sources and found that the Leviathan storyline was based on H.P. Lovecraft's uh, Cthulhu um, series, I read all of H.P. Lovecraft. And then I found out that he lived in Providence, and many of the houses and structures and locations in his stories are 
accurate descriptions of those in his neighborhood, and would you know different names of course. Right. And But he, you could, when you go to Providence, you can find the house where this character lived and the house where that character lived. Exactly. And the house where this took place, and it's really interesting because it's all cramped. There are these 18th and 19th century houses mostly federal style, on a steep hill um, with small front yards and wrought iron fences. And one, as you go up the hill, you can look down at the roofs of the others down to the shore. And you can feel the claustrophobia he must have felt. The houses were on top of each other. The That's yards a great were thing narrow. To exactly. You the shunned house looks like a shunned house. It's um, got a tree, like, nearly blocking it, and it's all shuttered up and narrow, and wonder, why is why are the windows all closed, why, um, shuttered? Why does the door um, not have a window? <laughs> it looks yeah, like yeah. a place that you shouldn't go. <laughs> so I, that's obviously one other great thing about your book was your descriptions are really good for that sense of place that sense of like here's why uh hp lovecraft was great at dread at great at imparting that there's there's nothing overtly wrong but it's just you're uneasy here because it's it's too dark even though it's daylight it's this house is too closed off instead of uh, uh, the things you mentioned i um and, and especially back when there were, like, say, in the time of um, federal mansions and so forth, it was, wow, wealth gives you height. You know, in every um, city where there was an advantage to be gained from looking down on the little people, that is indeed often where they had the hill with all the rich houses. But then you also find out that they're people, too. They have problems and scandals and stuff like that. And so you see this pretty facade. But within there's difficulty. There's rot. And, and Lovecraft was great at capturing that, 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 you know, people can go quietly mad. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Look to the world like they're they're handling things, but no, they're really um, not in their right mind or they're not even able to explain to somebody else, I hear things. I, I see things out of the corner of my eye. Um, and anyway, that's, so I, I've, I have been, I've not been to Providence, I've only well, actually, let me take you back. I think I've been to Providence, but it's because I went to the state capitol. I didn't go to the sites that you're talking about. So um, w when you go there, do you have a list of places that you're looking for? In other words, there is some literature that says this house, the Shunned house, is indeed actually the um, Biltmore house or whatever else it might be, and that you're kind of putting all that together um, as, a, as a, a horror tourist, if you will. Well, I don't. That's not the only kind of travel I do. I'm I'm interested in 18th and 19th century and Renaissance literature as well. Mm -hmm. um, when I travel, though, I I, I I travel as an amateur archaeologist, an amateur anthropologist, and a literary and historical researcher. Um, for you know, I'm very Victorian in that aspect. I try to be a little bit of everything. And I do have a tight agenda everywhere I go. I'm working on my plans for two weeks in Salem this fall. I have a um, very packed itinerary, new things to do in Salem, as well as going to Cohasset, where The Witches of Eastwick was filmed, and finding the grave of Mercy Lewis, the vampire who um, was uh, well, most famous vampire in New England. New England had a big vampire outbreak in the 1800s. And then I'm going also to... Hopefully, n nobody will interfere with my plans this time around to go to England in March to Chillercon, the Core Writers Association English branch, and after in Scarborough. After which, I intend to spend a week or so in Cornwall, and I am working out a specific itinerary to track down all the Arthurian sites. Fantastic! So, uh, wow. Speaking as, you know, uh, an alpha geek, Stephen and I, we love talking about so much of what we do isn't like, let's go lay on the beach somewhere. It's there's there's history tourism, there's science tourism, there's yeah. literary tourism. And much like you're saying, I don't just show up. I usually do a whole bunch of research so that it's like, well, while we're there, did you know that there's also a Viking ship and that there's also a SETI site and whatever else it might be? So um, I, I didn't mean to um, imply that 
the only touring that you do is horror. It's only because it's the theme of your book. But even in your book, you talk a lot about the places that you've been have significance just in real history. You know, going to Stonehenge is not only um, were there druids there, it's that there's a mystery surrounding it. You know, we're pretty sure we know how they built what they did, but why did they do it? And why exactly there? And what does the placement mean perhaps beyond um, um, astronomical or astrological? Just that you you captured well that while you're there, you're taking in a lot, and there's a whole bunch of ways in which your interests um, that that might be what first attracts you is well this is I think what it is, is Whitby Walby this is where Dracula landed you know on the coast of England but while you're there there's other cool things to do and you take those in as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So other than the uh, dark shadows, what's some of your favorite places you've visited? Well, I really love Transylvania. It is really cool. I went there to find the Dracula sites. They're only about 100 miles of paved road in Romania. Um, And after you leave the city, you're going... I I hired a driver to take me around three days around Transylvania after I left Bucharest. I thought that was very cool. You're going on these winding, narrow roads and... Around blind corners are coming hay wagons that are like two stories tall or more and um, with horse drawn. And they, they have common grazing areas for shepherds of the community and they have a lot of shrines for travelers, Byzantine style, um, along the road. It's a whole different world. Um, it's also really cool because they, in addition to the um, remains of Dracula sites, Vlad the Impaler, right. there Vlad. are Vlad. many Roman and Dacian ruins. I mean, they're just everywhere you go traveling down the road, driver would say, oh, that's an ancient Roman thing. That's an ancient Dacian thing. It's like, oh, I want to see them all. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, a, it Transylvania is, um, in Romania is a really cool country. I, I have always wanted to go there. I have not done what you've done put together like if anything you know my getting there and wanting when Colleen and I travel we often like get a car and we do our own roving but there are places where I kind of want to have a guide like you did you know someone that that took you kept you safe um knew the history of it so they can be a little bit of a docent if you will um so um a lot of what you talked about in the book was the actual history of Vlad the Impaler and that he actually like was a leading force for keeping the Romans out. You know, there was all the expansion of the Roman Empire was stopped by various different people that were, I guess, equally warlike or equally um, cruel. <laughs> you know, that's that's pretty much how Dracula did it, right? By having the forest of the impaled, if I remember right, that the Romans came up and said, "These guys are beyond serious. Look at look at what." <laughs> so, what did um, what when you went there? What was that like? Did it have, like, what was your feelings there? A lot of people died terribly. Does it have any of that eeriness to it, or is it just the forest? Well, um, it's actually, um, they, they're a little defensive about Dracula there. They consider him a national hero. Oh, hero. And exactly. they, um, some of the people, my driver, resented the, you know, the fictionalization of Fled as a vampire Dracula, um, but you know they're they're the last communist country they, I've heard to recover from, um, and they really don't get capitalism well enough to make money off of this reason that a lot of people travel there. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 but yeah, it was actually not the Romans; it was the Ottomans. It was in the 1400s, and it was the Turks. Um, the Thanks. Muslim Turks that were trying to invade Europe, all the Crusades would stop at Romania, which is on the one side of the Black Sea from Turkey. And sometimes the, these Crusades, the heads of Europe would gather their armies to go win back the Holy Land from the Turks, and they'd come to Romania. And some of them stopped along the way, and the knights went off on other adventures, and they, or the funds dried up, and they never made it. And so there'd be this war brewing, and Romania was left to hold the bag. It wasn't Romania then, it was um, different, um, three different provinces, but 
that area was left to hold the bag. Once they'd stirred up the Ottomans who knew that a war was coming, they, the, the people in Wallachia and Transylvania had to hold them off without the European armies that were supposed to have come. And then it was also the time when everybody was barbarous in Europe. Henry VIII was chopping off people's heads and stretching them on the rack. Right. And in the Spanish Inquisition, they were putting people's eyes out and burning them at the stake. Um, it right. was a terrible time to live um, the end of the Dark Ages, un unless you were one of the elite. Everybody else, one day, one, one armed force would come in and rape your women or steal them and the children, burn down the houses, kill all the animals, and wipe Fun. the city off the earth. <laughs> then the next... Next week, another force would come in and repeat the whole thing. And so one day you belong to this country, and another day you belong to another country. It's kind of like the wars of the 19th century, World War One, World War Two. <laughs> the, right, the boundaries kept order. getting redrawn. Right. Yes, exactly. I, my being, you know, I'm Lithuanian and German, and so we have some experience from being overrun or being the overrunner. <laughs> terrible way to put it. But like people talk about that in the the Baltics or Poland, where no matter what war was going on, somehow their resources were being stripped, their people were being killed. So you're right, there's been times in history, all throughout history, where the little people were fodder. They were not, there was nowhere near the protections and the uh, the dignities that the Enlightenment <laughs> started to afford them. So, okay. I, this is kind of a, a I'm not sure how much you might have seen of this there. You know, I one of my favorite quotes is, the future's already here, it's just not evenly um, applied. Um, I remember watching a series with Michael Taylor. You know, he does a whole bunch of great travelogue series. And one of them was he was working his way through the former Soviet Union, you know, the East European republics. And there's all kinds of modernity. They really do have, of course, cars and running water and Wi-Fi and whatever else it might be. But he was going, he was invited to attend a wedding and part of getting the wedding blessed was that the local priest sacrificed a goat. And it was like, wow, that's pretty much, I thought that was not done anymore. You know, I knew that <laughs> to, to see that there was still a certain amount of, well, you know, a, an, like animal spirit, sacrifice. And this really was a priest kind of modernized. He didn't seem to have voodoo aspects to him he wasn't santeria ish i know i'm mixing ter terribly between cultures but he seemed just like the culture seemed like a regular place and yet there were some holdovers of we don't know whether it really works or not but just to hedge our bets let's well, a sheep let's kill it well not? i mean it's just <laughs> it's just a tradition that they've gotten used to i mean our white dress our exchanging of the rings you know all those are just you know well, if you ask anybody why do you do it it's like well it's just because that's what you do yeah and, and actually now that i think of it i think it was and my question was well are they killing it because that's going to be part of the feast no it really was to have good luck to have beneficence and so to, to, to not only me talk, did you see any things that were like that there, that that stark contrast between the world is pretty modern and yet there's interesting customs that are still followed in Transylvania, um, Wallachia, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, no, um, I didn't see them, but um, PBS has done good uh, program on that because they are still in out in the country at least digging up graves and staking vampires. Um, there's still a lot of belief in that in yeah, that's Romania. Cool. Okay. So let's let's jump over. You mentioned that you had been in London and also Bath, Stonehenge, etc. What what were the kinds of things that drew you to there? I made the Dracula reference because of the book, but you also talked about the legend of the ravens or other things. Um, it sure sounds like London is, I mean, London is an ancient city and it has multiple layers that have kind of been, I'm trying to think, is this London that we that you talked about in your book? You know, one of those cities where they kept building another layer on top of um, previous city and that you actually can like go down into old places that might've been at one time the city streets, but now they're buried. So I know like Seattle has that, London has that, I, I'm sorry that I'm not. If I'm not getting the reference right with London, where was that location? That 
you actually kind of went exploring in the catacombs. Um, well, catacombs I, I saw in um, Brazov in Transylvania, um, the piled up bones in the bottom of the black church. Um, the in, It was in Italy that I saw Roman roads excavated beneath um, modern, modern day streets. Yes. Um, in in England, I I think the highlight was going to Whitby, where Dracula's boat, the Demeter, washed ashore in the storm, and to actually stand on that windswept cliff on right on the northeast corner of the country on the North Sea, with the wind blowing, tall grasses blowing, and these skeletal remains of Whitby Cathedral there, and all these tilted, worn headstones and Celtic crosses and this is where Lucy and Nina actually sat, you know, and exactly. where they talked about about the suicides. And then you go across the harbor to the other side, and you can it's a U-shaped harbor. And um, from the height of one side is a bench that is marked where Bram Stoker sat, and he looked over the water of the harbor to the other side to look at the ruined cathedral, and that gave him the inspiration for Carfax Abbey in Dracula. Fantastic. Okay. I, I, and, and at Carfax Abbey, you know, that was um, destroyed by the Danes during the Viking invasion, and it was where the poet Cademan um, lived when it was a monastery. It's It's been there forever, Um built by William the Conqueror, I think. Um, That's one of the things that you mentioned in your book was, you know, like, the United States is a punk. We're 200 plus years old, but you go to Europe and there's places that they're a thousand years, 2,000 years occupied, um, and that there's really a sense of history when you have people still living in buildings that are 500 years old. You can see, like, ancient mortar. That's how they built them back then. Um, any, what, like, that, and that seems to be like when you think about looking across the harbor at a crumbling cathedral, in some cases there's ruins everywhere. In other cases, they're still living in those buildings and from the tightness of the walkways between them, from the cellars that are underneath, you really start to get that sense of place and of spooky place because <laughs> there's more atmosphere to it, if you will. Um, yes, that's that's um, the sense you get from travel. I'm afraid this current emphasis on uh, virtual life, people are losing a sense of place. Everybody knows that to go back to look at your childhood home is not the same as to look at a picture. To be in a place where um, a historical event happened, um, where um, um, is... It's just, it's a different human experience, and I'm afraid with all this, uh, the virtual world we're living in now, people are losing that sense of place, and what you get in this place is artificial, and we are multidimensional beings and can't get everything filtered through somebody else's words and pictures. I totally agree. And that's one of the things that Colleen and I often, when we, we are probably the most traveled of her family, let's say. And when we talk about, you know, if you're going to go to the Grand Canyon, you don't want to like have seen it on TV. It isn't anywhere near the experience of being next to this truly awesome, natural, like the light is different, the rocks are different, the, 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 the size of it is just so overwhelming that unless you're standing on the edge of it, you know, you don't get it from having... I don't know, when I've seen like Laura Croft uh, games and they take you to this tomb and that undersea, whatever else it might be, what it inspires in me is I want to go there. I don't want just the, the video game experience. I want to go see what it's like to stand at Petra and see, wow, there's this thing built into a, a, a cliffside here that's been here for 2000 years. Why did they do it? What's it like inside? You know what I mean? It, it it inspires me to want to go there in much the way that you're describing that virtual ain't enough i really want to like have the full sensory what does it smell like <laughs> what does the wind sound like around you? 
like like thing. like the monolith caved uh, from the third Indiana Jones movie where they went in. Uh, that I would love to go see. Exactly. Put that on your list. Well, <laughs> look, Catherine, let me ask you, um, wh with all the travels you've been, is there anywhere close, like a one tank trip here from North Ohio that people could go to? Um, there are a number of them in my book. Um, let me see. Gettysburg, Philadelphia. Gettysburg. Michigan, exactly. I was making, actually making Gettysburg is, and, um, and uh, the Flight 93 Memorial. Um, yeah. which we saw that on the way back from the last trip. It's just so, so moving. When you walk, walk on that battlefield, I mean, that's an eight-hour drive. And the, the, the town there is not commercial. It's full of little antique stores and wine shops and things. Uh, you can buy a lot of T-shirts in a lot of places. But they're in the old buildings with the old porches and the old benches in front. Right. There, um, there's no mass commercialization, no... Um, chains or national brands there and you can eat in the diner um, across the street from the train station Lincoln came in for the Gettysburg Address wow. you can, when you walk on the battlefields you feel the energy you feel all those emotions you feel fear, grief astonishment you feel the blood of Cain and Abel um, wow. That's why it's considered hard. You've got all those. You're, you're walking out where so many people died, and the the visitor center is really great for telling the story. I like it because it's not like oh, it's the North versus the South, um, trying to keep the Union together or trying to free the slaves. Cliches. No, it just tells the story of how the tenuous peace broke as they admitted more states to the Union, and each time they did that, they had to decide whether it would be slave or free, and people's moral, people's financial, all kinds of political um, uh, oh, considerations came into question, and it was a very complex issue for everybody. It was not an easy choice, and they tell, do a good job of telling that story in the visitor center. And then uh, in the Laurel Highlands, um, between here and Gettysburg, is the Flight 93 Memorial. When I went there, they hadn't built the visitor center yet. They had kiosks which with pictures and the last words of people. Wow. And they had a big pasture behind which were these huge trees. It's really high up. My ears popped driving up that high. And there's a boulder where the plane went down, and that's all. Yeah. And no one was allowed to approach the boulder except families. And we actually, um, Pauline and I, have been there both be, when it first happened, and they had set up some kind of memorial, but not built everything. And we've been there since, where they actually do have the visitor center and the timeline of what happened, and much more explanation of um, who was able to get word or text out, and how many. It, just that it's incredibly moving. If you if you want to go back to it, we we were sitting there, you know, tears in our eyes because this terrible thing happened, and they've really captured um, what led up to it, and and how it's very reverent. It's very um, you can walk all around that field. Again, you still can't go out to to touch where it actually happened. You know, you're not going to go like trying to find a piece of wreckage or anything terrible like that, but just seeing where it happened and the expanse of the debris field you know that when you when you crash a plane it doesn't just go into the earth like a cartoon it went a whole field of stuff that were pieces of the plane and pieces of people and it was it captures the terror of it really well and now uh, al we talked about this that would be the perfect site to have some ar goggles where you could see the actual landscape but it would overlay a hologram essentially of the plane of pieces Without being disrespectful, uh, you know, to see that time forward back and forth as to here's what it looked like, what it felt like when it was coming down and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, you know, um, I, I listened to your your podcast on Salem, and you were Stephen, I, I believe, were saying that it was seemed a little disrespectful to have all the present day hoopla. Um, 
there, but I don't think so. I think Salem is one of the rare places in the world that has learned from its history. They um, are the human rights capital of the world, is the way I look at it now. They work so hard to um, to foster inclusiveness. Nobody of any kind of person needs to feel uncomfortable in Salem. And the witchery that you have now and all the Halloweening um, is a celebration. The witches were the victims. Um, they weren't real witches, but... Right. Um, they, but they, but the witches um, are like the hostesses of the city now. They have an official witch. They have witches on the police cars. Um, it's it's a celebration of they've got their own now. It's a celebration of individuals' rights to um, choose their own destinies, follow their own paths, um, as opposed to status quo. So just because you celebrate at a site where something terrible happened doesn't mean that you're necessarily being disrespectful that's a good point yeah actually and i love that you know very inclusive that you could be any type of witch you want <laughs> i like that yep. or you could be any type of human being you want they you know they don't everybody's welcome everybody's welcome I, I thought that chapter in your book about that, about your many visits to Salem, and especially that you did a really good distillation of how it came to happen. You know, that of course there weren't burnings, but there were hangings, and that it was accusations by teens, and that there's some part of, I, I won't even try to explain it as well as you did. You, you did a very good distillation of how this terrible thing happened, kind of out of the madness of crowds, and that indeed the crucible by Miller about the McCarthy witch hunts, you know, that's kind of where that term entered the modern vocabulary, if you will, was that often being referred to a witch hunt. Nowadays, people seem to use it as a way of getting to look away from where terrible things are happening. You know, the minute that you're inconvenienced, somebody calls it a witch hunt, which is a ridiculous and, and is respectful. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Just that. I, yeah. I have, we've not been to Salem. We've been all over New England in many different ways, but we haven't it's kind of like we don't want to just go there. We want to take the time to go there. You know what I mean? There's so much history to drink in and to learn about and so forth that we're going to make that a destination when we can do it justice. I think that's our intent. So. Yes, but you should you should spend some time there. Um, there is an awful lot to learn. Another um, one thing trip is um, is Philadelphia. There's um, of course the Statue of Liberty and Independence Hall, which are wonderful places. I'd been there in the bicentennial with my mother's Girl Scout troop. Um, wow. And then I was there again recently. Yeah. Um, and the Philadelphia Free Library has a really cool um, rare books collection. And among the rare books is, in, in a case there, is a stuffed raven, which was Dickens' pet. And also Poe's inspiration for the raven. So you can see the actual raven there. Oh, that's cool. How cool and, is that? Uh, and on the street where the um, Sixth Sense was filmed, on that same street is the Rosenbach Library. Okay. And they have Dracula's notes, uh, Bram Stoker's notes for Dracula. You can see where he wrote, Mina's head cut off on September 29th on the dust calendar he used. Oh, man. Of the plot. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and they're available to the public. Um, I made an appointment to spend time in the reading room. And I also looked at the 15th century um, woodcut pamphlet the German monks were um, circulating about Vlad the Impaler. Um, wow. So th those are all free in Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, and then in, oh. in Evans City, just over the border okay. of Pennsylvania, is the cemetery where they filmed Night of the Living Dead. When you See, walk among those um, headstones, are leaning this way and that way in the graves that seem like they're coming out of the earth you sure sure feel like you're in a zombie movie <laughs> believe it or not we've been there um colleen's son tim actually studied in college uh, to how to make a uh, horror movie makeup he was living in manesson pennsylvania where that's um tom savini i believe is his name that did makeup for uh, a number of the living dead movies and so forth and he was in school to learn how to do that well and so of course in the act of dropping him off, visiting him, et cetera, et cetera. We made a, pointing, a point of going to that cemetery because it's so famous of with course. the atmosphere. And we went to the Monroeville Mall. I think you also mentioned that in your writings because that's where they roamed, all the zombies roamed around in a modern setting. I think it was Day of the Dead or no, I'm trying to think which movie it was. Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead, thank you very much. Yeah. So I, 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 I was 
pleased to be able to say, wow, I've actually, you know, been to some of these things because of Tim's interest, but our own interest of when you're at that cemetery, it really is creepy. You really feel like, boy, if something starts if the earth starts, <laughs> I am vamoosing out of this place. Well, well you know, uh, Savini and Romero worked with uh, George, uh, Stephen King on the Creep Show movie, yeah. and and if you watch, I forget where I saw it, but Joe Hill was the little boy uh, in that movie, and so he, I've heard him tell some stories about Savini and the, because cool. he was like he's like this god when. Joe was five or something, you know. Right. Joe was Stephen King's son, exactly. So, right. Okay. Well, speaking of Stephen King, I've done a lot of traveling in the last year. Um, I went to, I just got back from Colorado. I went to Estes Park to stay in the Stanley Hotel where King stayed at when he saw the ghosts and came up with the idea for The Shining. Shot me. Um, okay. which, which was used in, and he used the same hotel in the miniseries. He wasn't happy with the movie changing the location. Okay. Um, and then um, I went to the Denver Park, Chisholm Park, where they, um, where the events of the Changeling took place in real life, um, according to the writer. And okay. then I went to um, I went to the Seattle area. I stayed in Snoqualmie for a couple of weeks at the end of October, okay. and that's where the Great Northern Hotel from Twin Peaks was. So I, I tracked down all the Twin Peaks sites. I had Special Agent Dale Cooper pick me up in his black <laughs> SUV and take me, escort me to all these Twin Peaks sites. I was, I was beside myself. <laughs> it was really, 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 really wonderful. Very cool. So and I went to Bal Baltimore to see the Edgar Allan Poe sites and yeah. And the last chapter of my book is about my trip last June to. Kentucky and Tennessee. I went there during the Black Lives Matter riots and the right. pandemic That's scare. The Hotel, and I think, right? yeah. To see um, the Bell Witch remains in a small town in Tennessee, population 600. Okay. It sounds like you're working on material for a sequel. You know, your travels continue and your observations that I, I would look forward to reading that sequel. So in case there's a creepy cat too, please let us know. <laughs> It's in the works. Maybe after I'm done with England, I'll have enough material to finish it up. Okay. You also made a reference to going to StokerCon, which is like the horror room convention. So uh, what, um, some quick impressions from there. I mean, you are one, but you also must have met a number of people that you are interested in, admire, etc. What Do you go to that on a regular basis, or is it is it one of many that you like to attend? Well, that was my first one. It was in 2019. I was supposed to read a paper at the 2020, but they went virtual, so I withdrew my paper because I don't do that. Um, and it was really cool. I went there mostly because of my friend, a Dark Shadows friend, and she is the author of Smithy, a wonderful ghost story set in Newport, Rhode Island, about um, a psych psychology graduate student team who are experimenting on teaching uh, chimpanzee sign language and he sees some ghosts he's trying to tell them about. It's a really good story. Um, interesting Smithy. combination. And, yeah. but okay. The second draw was Dacre Stoker. You know, I'm wild yeah. about Dracula and I want he is the great 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 grand nephew of Bram Stoker. He's the bearer of the blood. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. could go down on my knees before the man. It's like <laughs> This is as close as I'll ever get to Bram Stoker. He's a wonderful man. He's been researching the history of Dracula and Bram Stoker's life, and he also published a prequel called um, Dracula the Undead, and uh, I mean a, a sequel called that, and a prequel called Dracul. And he also published the uh, Boss Journals of Bram Stoker. Yes. And he tells the story of how Dracula came to be, and Dacre Stoker is worth a trip whenever he's speaking somewhere. It was worth going to Grand Rapids, Michigan, just to see him. All right. I was going so to say... I was uh, there, I met many other interesting people. Josh Mallerman, who wrote Bird Box, and oh, cool. I heard um, a, a number of good uh, panels speaking on good and evil and life and death, and focusing on The Exorcist, yeah. And people speaking on, 
let's see, the haunt, uh, ambiguously haunted hills, hoss, ambiguously haunted houses featuring the haunting of Hill House and the turn of the screw. Okay. And um, just general philosophy about what monsters represent. And there's a final film competition based on um, real um, horror shorts that were re- from around the world that, that were really amazing. Horror Writers Association is going to be in Denver next year. Um, it's a really good convention for writers and fans, StokerCon. Yeah. Well, a uh, well, couple things with that, because uh, I've been doing some writing, Catherine. Um, did you happen to go to one of the year that uh, Jeff Strand was the MC at StokerCon? No. Uh, too bad. Um, but you mentioned Dracul, which uh, Dacre wrote with J.D. Barker, and I actually chat with J.D. Barker at times uh, on the books I'm writing. Uh, so that's kind of cool little connection for us there. But I know Dacre is going to be at the Michigan Paracon at the end of this month, and I'm going to that. Oh, great. Yeah. I'm looking, I'm hoping one of these days that I'll be available when he is taking tours. Um, usually I don't like tours. I like to park in a hotel for a couple of weeks and take day trips. Yes. Um, but I would make an exception for him. He leads tours, Dacre does to. Um, Ireland, Bram Stoker's birthplace, and to Transylvania. Ooh. And I would, um, I'm trying to hopefully join him on one of his trips when his schedule and mine work out together. Yeah, that would be way cool. Yeah. Wouldn't it? Um, yeah, he's he's just fantastic. He's the he's the bearer of the torch. He is um, keeping the legacy alive and enriching it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Exactly. I've never been to a horror specific con, but I've been to any number of science fiction or comic book, and there's often crossover and stuff like that. And that's one of the joys is when you get to meet an author that you like, and you actually, like on a panel, you'll there will be three, four, five people that it's very cool to see them interact because, of course, they have different writing styles, different sensibilities, and sometimes they're very admiring of each other's work, and sometimes they're actually a little bit competitive, or they've known each other for so long that they tease each other, and the... I, I, I don't know where I'm going with this, except to say it's very nice to see people human when you've only known them as an author. You know, I, I tend to do the mm-hmm. same thing with any number of authors that I would just like be kind of tongue tied and say, I love your work and you formed me as a human being. And I don't know what to say after that. <laughs> but you get a chance to, you know, like, what music do you like? And you get a chance to see the jokes they laugh at. It's, it's a very, um, joining thing for, you know, they're human like me. It's wonderful that they've produced the works that they have, but I, especially Stephen, you as an author, you get a chance to say, well, I can do that too. I'm working on exactly that same kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. You might be able to find someone who's already accomplished at it to give you some coaching in it. What a wonderful yeah. guild relationship. You know what I mean? What a wonderful it, passing along of the knowledge. And I, I, a lot of the authors are way cooler than I imagine most bigger name actors are. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. So, can I, could I mention my appearances that are coming up? Please. Please do. I'm so happy that you are getting the things you're about to talk about, libraries and, and universities and so forth. Please give us the list. Well, I'm going to present Salem Past and Present Intermixed with a PowerPoint slideshow um, on September 28th at Menor Library, in October at um, Akron Library, Will- Willoughby East Lake Library, in Geneva Library, all in Ohio, of course. And on October 7th at John Carroll uh, for the Alumni Author Series, I'm going to present um, the Bell Witch Project, uh, my Black Lives Matter and pandemic travel story, too. Got it. Down in Kentucky and Tennessee. Exactly. Okay. And I think you sent me that list, did you not, Catherine? I did. I have an updated list now if you want it. Yes, it please. Changed since I sent it to you. Yeah. Oh, we'll, we'll be happy that. to share that on, on the Relentless Geekery website. You know what I mean? It isn't only the podcast. We're happy to to create these tentacles that yeah. reach out to the world and say, you know, if you like what you already heard from Catherine, she's actually doing a, not just a chat, but an actual concerted presentation. I'd love to see. Well, as you know, we had you at um, uh, a CAM monthly gathering when you had just come back from one of your Salem travels, and it was wonderful. I mean, 
the showing the town, the photos, the costumery, et cetera, et cetera. And to have you not only it be, a, hey, here's something cool I did, but to actually have you put the wrapper around it of, here's the significance of it. You know, you're wonderfully observational and wonderfully conclusion drawing as to, it isn't just a series of little vignettes and, a, and, and like tiles in the mosaic, you put the mosaic together into beautiful patterns of, here's the difference between ancient life and modern life. Here's this sense of place, but here's how it comes. I, I don't know, I, I, as opposed to making broad statements, I thought that some of the best things in your book were not only the descriptions of where you were, but your impressions of it, because they were very insightful and very like inspiring to say, I'd like to experience that too. I'd like to see this place and feel those things and learn about it in the same way that you have. So if that's part of what you're always trying to do with the book is not just entertain, but actually get people to take action. There's very cool for a travel book that you can actually say, I want to travel as well. So good for you. Very successfully done. Yeah, that's cool. All compliments accepted. Thank you very much. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. So um, anything else, Stephen? I think we're uh, up on yeah. it. I think so. Uh, okay. It's been a really great. Uh, I, I'm going to have to grab the book, Catherine. I haven't grabbed it yet. So now I want to see all these places. There we go. It's oh, like uh, Neil Zerker's one tank trips. Exactly. Um, I, I have um, a book of uh, haunted Ohio places by a uh, gentleman I met at StokerCon, and I've used his book to travel to a couple places in Ohio. I didn't see any ghosts, but they're very good vacation destinations in it. Right. I, I will say this, you know, of, of the two of us, I'm probably the the more skeptical, you know, and, and I say that. we're both skeptical, but you are, Stephen, you are uh, um, more embracing of, we don't know everything, and so let's keep looking, whereas I have a whole, a whole shield up of, well, that doesn't make sense. Right. And, but having said that, another thing I really liked about your observations, Catherine, was that it wasn't the woo-woo stuff. It wasn't, oh, I, I shivered because there was a presence in the room. <laughs> You know yeah. what I mean? There's so there's so many stereotypes, but the fact that you can go to these places and say um, there is long-standing stories of um, this headless ghost roams these hallways. There's the blue nurse. I, I know I might be mixing between various different things you've talked about. There, it's worth investigating. Like, why is that so persistent? How many people have had that experience? Felt that chill? Um, got that uneasy feeling in this hotel, this room, this field, whatever else it might be? Um, I, I love experiencing that for myself. You know, I've been on battlefields where there's just energy there. You can tell something big happened here and you'll look around and you can see that's why this place was important. It's they had to take that hill. But in order to take that hill, they had to have this skirmish in the middle and, and whatever else it might be. So I, I guess in short, I, I like that you had a like a practical and relatively scientific viewpoint on this that it wasn't gushingly and then i saw a ghost because i i would automatically go well now i don't know how much i can trust your other observations <laughs> jump to a conclusion that i don't think was warranted by the data if you will so right. um are there any places where like if you are usually that scientific and that observational are there any places that you really said wow i don't know how to account for this what's going on here um the Satanic Temple in Salem. I intend to go back there uh, again this trip. Um, it is an art museum, and uh, and uh, um, the main headquarters of the Satanic Temple, which their website says is um, anti-religion. It's not devil worship. Okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's taking a stand like. Um, as the agnostic faith doesn't have a religion, but it's against religion, so is the Satanic Temple. Okay. And um, I just got these vibes being there at midnight, wanting to see the Bathomet statue out behind the house. And uh, it's like, oh, I don't know if it's um, internal triggers or if it's um, nurturing, but I felt like I, have to, I was enjoying all the displays, the Ouija board room and things, and then... Uh, all the sculpture, and then I'm thinking, I need to get out of here. It's midnight, and I don't want to go around the house in the dark in the back to look at the statue. Isn't that you know, interesting? I, okay. I do stand up for their right to display the bath and the statue the way the cross is displayed in other places. I'm, you know, equal rights for every individual is my right. stand. 
However, I got the creeps that day. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I can't explain it. I just fled. And I don't do that <laughs> generally. Especially for a person that's been in multiple, if you will, spooky places or places that have a, a difficult history. When you get the, hmm, <laughs> what's going on here? It's I, when I, when I, I am, like I said, pretty skeptical. And yet when I've been in a place where I was like unnerved and you're looking for, so what is the trigger? What is the atmosphere? What's my... What am I sensing or intuiting from what I, where I am that I'm feeling this way? I think that's interesting to just say, not sure why, but I know I want to get out. <laughs> you know, it I know could I have been it home. could have been intuition. It could have been too many Hammer movies, and I felt like I was in a B movie. I don't know. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. When you're scared, don't go into the basement. Stay away from the basement. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much, yeah. Cap. Any, any final great. Even this was a pleasure to have yeah. you on and to be able to, to investigate you and your book. And I hope you have wonderful audiences so they get to drink you in at these uh, upcoming future appearances as well. That'll be great. Yeah. Thank nice you very to much. You. Okay. All right. Signing Thanks, Cap. Great time. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll have this posted within uh, whatever reasonable amount of time is to make sure that we're cl a couple clean. days. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye. Nice talking to you, Stephen. Okay. Yes, you too. Bye-bye. Right. Okay. okay.
You have been listening to the Relentless Geekery Podcast. Come back next week and join Alan and Stephen's conversation on Geek Topics of the Week.